Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will start the first epistle of Peter. So today, we will cover chapter 1. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, where else can we go and uh, find knowledge and truth, if not in your word? For the entrance of your word gives life. It gives understanding to the simple. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Father God, as we turn our hearts towards you in search of the truth, I pray that you will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding by your Holy Spirit. You will unveil to us the truth that you will help us to identify the things that hinder us from the truth. When Hezekiah found out what your word said, he went into the temple and he brought out the brass serpent, which uh, Israelites worshipped. And he broke it into pieces and said, Nuhushtan! A thing of the brass. But I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will help us identify idols in our lives. The things that hinder us from having a complete knowledge of your word. And we will say the same thing. Nuhushtan. Walk away from them and come to the knowledge of the truth. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. But unto your name we give glory, honor, and praise for everything you have done. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Glory, hallelujah. My good friends, today we will start um, the first epistle of uh, Peter. Uh, let me give you... Um, a background of this epistle that we are about to uncover. This epistle is written by Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, originally called Simon, but Jesus Christ changed his name to Peter, Petros, which means uh, a pebble, a small stone. He is the brother of uh, Andrew, the sons of uh, Jonah, or you can say John. He grew up in Bethsaida, but um, when later on he moved to Capernaum, which is where Jesus Christ had his headquarter, ministry headquarter. From what we read, in the um, Gospels, he, is an, he, he was a very impulsive person. And church history had it uh, that uh, he is a, a big guy, you know, physically. He wrote this epistle around uh, 64 AD. And uh, he, he wrote it to the Jews who were scattered at this point all over Asia Minor, which is um, modern day Turkey. The purpose of writing this epistle is to encourage them in their trial. Uh, uh, he told them that um, as God's elect, that God is with them in their trials. He also told them how to conduct their uh, 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 manners while they're going through the trial to give God glory. He encouraged them to look past their present trials and look forward for that uh, eternal glory that shall be revealed to us at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to go ahead now and start verse 1. And um, uh, Peter, him, Peter died before we, uh, we, we, we continue. Peter died around uh, 66 AD. And uh, he, was, he, he died by crucifixion. As a matter of fact, uh, 
during his crucifixion, he said uh, he was not worthy to die in the same manner as his uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. So he requested to be turned upside down. That was how Peter was uh, crucified. That's one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and uh, Bithynia. Peter here is uh, writing to the Jews who were scattered all over Asia Minor. So persecution started in Jerusalem and it caused uh, some of the Jews to scatter. So some of them went to Asia Minor, which is uh, uh, modern day Turkey. And not only the persecution that started in Jerusalem, but you remember the 64 AD Great Fire of Rome, when Rome was set ablaze, when Emperor Nero was the Caesar. Uh, it was believed that this fire was started by Emperor Nero himself. But he turned around and he blamed the Christians. And because of this, it exacerbated the persecution of uh, Christians. And uh, at some point, the Christians over there called him the beast. So this is the audience Paul, Peter writes to this uh, audience. In verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Let me give you a quick summary, then I'll go in details. So he tells them that they are chosen by God before the foundation of the earth. And uh, the work was accomplished by the Spirit of God, who the Spirit of God is the one who convicts you of the sin of rejection of Jesus and brings you into the kingdom of God. And while you are in the kingdom of God for the purpose of uh, obedience to Christ Jesus, and when you miss it, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all our unrighteousness. I will go in details now. He brings out here the doctrine of uh, divine election. The doctrine of divine election means that God chose us from the foundation of the earth. There are so many Christians, they find it difficult to understand this doctrine. But the doctrine of divine election is possible because God has foreknowledge. He knows everything. He sees the end from the beginning. So God knew those who would hear the gospel of, and then they received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And then he wrote their names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the earth. That's what it means. And there are scriptures in the Bible that they tell us about the foreknowledge of God. One of them is in, uh, found in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse uh, 18, I believe. And it says, Not unto God are all uh, uh, his works from the beginning of the word. And if we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, uh, For who he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ, his son. So he has foreknowledge. He knows everything before they happen. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet for the nations. God has foreknowledge. So he knew those who would receive the gospel when they hear the gospel. And then he wrote their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, with the divine election of God comes with a human volition. What is human voli volition? It is your choice, human choice. God created you and I as a, as a, as, as a mortal agent. 
So he gave us the right to make our own choice and our own decision. And he will not violate that privilege or that right. It is left to you and I to make that decision, to choose Christ, to come into the kingdom of God. And uh, we have the scriptures for that. So many of them in the Bible, but I just give you a few. Those and those that receive him, he gave the power to become the children of God. You are the one who's going to make the choice to receive him. When you do that, you are given the power to become a child of God, to be born again. And uh, Jesus Christ says to those that come to me, I will by no wise cast away. When you make the decision to come into the kingdom of God, he will not cast you away, but he will receive you. So we are the ones who's gonna, who, who will make the choice to come into the kingdom of God. If you don't understand this doctrine, believe because the Bible tells us to believe. Even when we don't understand and then you ask the Holy Spirit of God to give you revelation knowledge and uh, understanding. Now, the next thing he talked about here is um, sanctification. When God, he said God chose us from the foundation of the earth. Now, it is made possible by the Holy Spirit of God because he is the one Jesus said will convict the world of one sin. And that sin is the rejection of Jesus Christ. So when you got born again, you were convicted by the Holy Spirit of God to hear the, when, you had the, when you heard the gospel and then you made that decision to come into the kingdom of God. And that day when you came into the kingdom of God, the Spirit of God recreated your own spirit and gave you a new spirit, such that was never before, never existed before. Two things happened that day. Sanctification, we have a, 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 a positional sanctification. Positional sanctification means that you that day you got born again. It is settled forever. You were born again. Now we have a, another work of the, uh, uh, the Spirit of God, which is a progressive sanctification. Now, progressive sanctification is something that will happen a lifetime. You do not arrive on this one until you see Jesus. This is now the work of the Holy Spirit within you to conform you to the image of Christ, to give you that spirit-led life by your own cooperation. So through the word of God, he shows you when you read and then you believe and then you do what he says. Now you become what you just read from the word of God. So this is a progress that the spirit of God continues to make in us. And the purpose of making this progress, I said, is to conform us to the image of Christ. So we become obedient to the commandment of Jesus Christ, the commandment of love, what the word of God says. And uh, while we are in this uh, uh, status, when we miss it, when we miss the mark, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we see this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, I see a beautiful picture of the Trinity of God in this verse here, verse 2. So there are those who say, I don't see Trinity in the Word of God, but we have the doctrine of Trinity all over the Bible. So for those who trouble you about this, <laughs> you point them out to this one. This is one of them here. He salutes them with grace and peace. Now you will see John, he salutes in this manner. Paul salutes in this manner. He's always in this order, grace and peace. Now, the reason is this, until you understand the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the love of God for us, his forgiveness, his uh, providence, his kindness, his mercy, forgiveness towards us is not based on what we do or on self-righteousness, but it's based on what Jesus Christ did. We receive it by faith. It is a, his grace. 
If you don't understand this, then you will never have the peace of God in you. Because whenever you miss the mark, you will be in that tension, in that position of uh, condemnation. And there is no peace because you believe that God is going to take a revenge on you and uh, punish you severely. We are now in... Um, I, 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 forgive me if I'm speaking too fast uh, because we have a lot to cover today. <laughs> we have about 24, 25 verses in this chapter. So I'm going to go <laughs> try to cover it. You know, one, one hour and one and a half hour is not enough, but uh, we still have to cover it. In verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So here, he praises God, the Father, for his mercy towards us, for not giving us what we deserve. In the Bible tells us that uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that the wages of that sin is death. And uh, the soul that sins, it shall die. So by justice, we deserve death. But God in his infinite mercy did not give us what we deserve. Rather, he gave us grace. Grace is when you receive something that you did not deserve. And that grace is Jesus Christ who came and uh, through his death and resurrection, we now have uh, 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 access to God. We are now called the children of God. We have now, uh, uh, we now become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, our hope would have been shattered. Are you, are you, do you understand what I'm saying? All the promises that Jesus Christ made to us, would have been in vain. Promises like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but, but by me. We would not have had any access to the Father because Jesus is the only way. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, the promise that he said, if anyone has the Son, he has eternal life. We will not have had eternal life. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, the promise he made to us when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, though he were dead, but yet he shall live. You see, there will not have been any resurrection of our bodies during the rapture of the church. So there are so many people who came up with uh, different theories. I call them empty theories. Trying to dispute, to diminish, to discount the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in every one of them, I have not seen anyone say that uh, we found his body. <laughs> they could not find the body of Jesus Christ. He was impossible. He was raised from the dead. So in all of these, their, their claims, uh, they are not able to provide the body of, a Jesus, of Jesus Christ. So now, not only that God gave us Jesus Christ, but he is going to keep us, protect us until the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even when we go through trials and tribulations, he's telling us here that he's going to keep us and protect us until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who began the good work in you will continue to perform it to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless to the presence of his glory with a seed in joy. In Jude 1 24, God is able to do this and he promised us that he would do it. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse um, 6. In all this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. What is he saying here? Peter says, remember, he is writing to this past Jews, those who were scattered all over Asia Minor because of trials and tribulations. He says to them, I understand that you are going through trials and tribulations. But he says, rejoice because it is only but for a moment. He says, it's not going to last. God allows us to go through trials because when we come out of these trials, we are not the same. When we go through trials, it purifies us. It makes us stronger and even more stronger. Remember, my friends, if you're born again today, I want you to condition this in your mind so you don't have a debate about it. Let it be settled permanently in your mind that trials and tribulations, they are part of the package, the Christian package. They will come. They come in multiple colors. They will come. But what do we do when they come? James tells us that we got to handle them with the attitude of joy. So we don't, we don't, we don't stress out and then we ask God, why is this trial coming to us? But rather we receive it with joy. That's why he says, count it all joy when you go through diverse trials. Knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. Let patience have her perfect work in you. So that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Paul writing says, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance or patience. You see, Peter brings in, brings in an analogy here about gold. Before you can have a pure gold, those who deal on gold, you know what I'm talking about. It must be it must, every impurity in that gold must be gone. It must go through fire to get rid of the impurities. Otherwise, you will not have a, a pure gold. So he brings the comparison, the same, to our faith. He see, before we will have that faith that is complete, that faith that is dedicated in walking with Christ, it will be tested. It will go through fire. That fire is trials and tribulations. And when we allow our faith go through trial and, and uh, tribulations, every impurity is knocked out. And now we are ready. We are complete in our work with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are, and, 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 and if I give you some biblical uh, uh, references about this trial. Remember, the Bible says, I reckon that the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. You cannot compare them. They are temporary. In a twinkle of an eye, they will be over. But that is an eternal glory that is coming. When Jesus Christ comes again, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your hope Oh, be focused on this glory that is coming. For our light affliction, which is only but for a moment, but works for us a far exceeding weight of glory. 
It is only for a moment. But what about the glory that is coming? When you remember this glory, my brethren, count it all joy because this trials is going to be over soon and you will enter into the glory of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 8, he says, Though you have not seen him, You love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Here he brings out the, one of the works of the Spirit of God in our hearts. He says, even though we have not seen Jesus Christ before, face to face, but we love him. How is this possible? Because the, the spirit of God in us bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So he bears witness. He tells us this is true. Jesus is real. And now because of that, we have a relationship with him. In every relationship, there are two key ingredients to make that relationship work love and trust so how do we know that we love jesus christ we keep his commandment he that has my commandments and keeps them he is he that loves me that's what jesus christ said so we we know we love him because we keep his commandments and uh, when we remember that we are one with him we have a, a relationship with him that is this joy that bubbles from within this joy is unexpressible. We don't know how to tell an unbeliever about this joy. If we tell them, they're going to say, you are not. You've gone crazy. This joy he talks about is there. But I know it's there because I have it in me. And I'm sure that you have this joy in you. He says, we have this joy, unspeakable, full of glory. When we remember this oneness we have with Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 9. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was come, that was to come to you, such intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the spirit of christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the messiah and the glories that would follow it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into this. Here he says, even though that you are going through trials, he says, rejoice because you have salvation. And he tells us about this salvation. He says, this is the salvation that the prophets prophesied about that the apostles and the teachers they proclaimed to us the angels of the lord they desire to know more about this salvation he says but you have this salvation now even in the midst of your trials this salvation is a, a working salvation even as we speak right now you know the prophets, they desired to find out more about this uh, salvation. When is this salvation going to happen? How is it going to happen? They wanted to find out. Even Daniel, in his prophecy, wanted to find more, more about it. But he was told to seal the book until the end of time. He says, People will go to and fro, but knowledge shall increase. 
the prophets were confused in their prophecy because none of them had a complete revelation. It was a piece over here and a little piece over there. For example, Isaiah in chapter 9 verse 8, he prophesied when he said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and of his kingdom, he says, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. Even forever and ever. So here, Isaiah just prophesied. The Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David. Forever and ever. But then he comes to Isaiah 53. He says, for he was numbered with transgressors in his death. Uh-oh, confusion. How is he going to die? But he's going to sit upon the throne of David. For he pleased the father to bruise him. For the father laid upon him the iniquities of us all. He was confused. He didn't understand it. He was bruised over iniquities. Now, in Psalm 22, it describes crucifixion by death. So, they didn't know exactly what was going on. They wanted to find out about this salvation. Even the angels of God. Remember, the angels were there when Jesus Christ was born. Because it was the angels who told the shepherds about the birth of Jesus Christ. They were there when Jesus was raised from the dead. It was the angels who rolled away the big stone that covered the tomb. The Bible tells us there is joy in heaven in the presence of the angels when one sinner comes to Christ. And now the angels, they know that we are the one who's going to judge the fallen angels. So they are wondering. They want to find out more about this salvation. Because it's not possible for an angel to be saved. But a man... When we are born with a, with a sin nature, we, we still have the privilege, the opportunity to be born again. So the angel, they want to find out what's going on about this. But he says, this salvation is now available to you and I. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he says, Therefore, with minds that are lost and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. While you are going through your trials, he says, do not set your mind there. Now he's talking about the mind. He says, do not allow your mind to uh, uh, to." to, to Entertain the thoughts of what you are going through. He says, this thing that you are going, you, you, going through, they are temporary. He says, rather, I want you to focus on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The glory that will be revealed in us when he comes back. Now, in verse 14, he's going to talk to us about uh, our mannerism. Verse 14, he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You see, so why are you going through your trials and tribulations? He says, there were things you did before you got born again. Before you got born again, your conscience was dead. It did not uh, condemn you. You did anything that you wanted to do. You had no power over resisting what the devil brings, brought to you at that time. He says, I don't want you to engage in those things anymore. Even though you're going through trials, he says, do not go with what you believed when you were not born again. An eye for an eye. If he slapped me in one cheek, 
I'm going to slap him double in his cheek. So, he rather, he says, remember what Jesus Christ said. Bless those who curse you. And you pray for those who spitefully use you. So, the conduct which we, 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 we followed, which we practiced before we got born again, he says, do not go back to that mannerism again because you are now born again. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, he says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So here he quotes from Leviticus. He says, I want you to be holy just like God is holy. Now, what is holiness? Because there are people who don't understand what it means uh, when somebody say holy. Now, it does not mean perfection. That's one thing you should understand. It means separated from this word system to God for the purpose of his kingdom. That's what it means to be, to be holy. <laughs> so he says, God is holy. I want you to live a life that is separated unto him. A life that is dedicated to the furtherance of the kingdom of God. A life dedicated to advancing the kingdom of God. A life that does not focus on the things of this earth, but a life that will always focus on God and the things of God. Verse 17 says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So what is he saying here? He says, now that you are away about your salvation, how you got born again, that you we are not saved because of your self-righteousness, because of your human traditions, because of the things that you did. He says, you are not saved by any of these things. Rather, he tells you how you are saved. You and I, how we are saved. He says, we are saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now he gives you more explanation. He says, this lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth, he says, is without any blemish or defect. Some translation will say without blemish or any spot. Now, a blemish is an uh, inherent defect. It means you are born with it. A spot is an acquired uh, 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 defect. You got it after you were born. Jesus Christ himself was not born in sin and did not commit any sin. This is why he was qualified to be the only one who could save the world from their sins. He says, this blood that saved you was a perfect blood. It wasn't the blood of goats and animals. He says, this blood the blood of Jesus Christ is the only blood qualified to wash away the sins of the whole world. He says, now you have this consciousness. I want you to live a life of the fear of God. When he talks about fear of God here, he's not talking about uh, uh, terror. No. Or dread. No. He's talking about... Uh, a reverential awe of God. That you love God so much that you are afraid 
that you will offend him. A willing, you, you willingly submit to the will of God, not by force or by uh, compulsion, but now it's out of your own will that you submit yourself to do those things that are pleasing to God. That's what it means by uh, 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 the fear of God. So he says, I want you now to leave that fear. And while you are living that fear, consider yourself. Know that you are only pilgrims. Those who are on a travel. Those who are citizens of heaven. But ambassadors here on earth. To advance the kingdom of God. He says, have this at the back of your, heart, of your mind. While you are even going through your trials. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. He says that God planned salvation from the foundation of the earth. He knew we, man, man is going to fall and he will need salvation. He planned it ahead of time. Not only that he planned it, but he went that step to fulfill it. So he made it possible for Jesus Christ to come. He fulfilled it. So now, through Jesus Christ, we have uh, access and boldness with confidence by faith in him. Through Jesus Christ now, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Through Jesus Christ now, we are made partakers. Through Jesus Christ now, we are accepted in the beloved. Because of the plan of God for us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth. So that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. While you are now walking in brotherly love. Because you were born again. Now note here. We have uh, the word love is used twice here. Now, in Greek, both words are not the same. The first one is Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. And the second one is agape, which is uh, the giving love of God. So he says, now you are born again and you are walking in brotherly love. I want you to <laughs> step it up. I want you to <laughs> give, it, give it a first lift. Advance now to the love of God, the agape love. Because you have the ability within you. In Romans chapter 5 verse 5, the Bible says, For the love of Christ, love of God, is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. This is the love that Jesus Christ commanded you and I. When he said, a new commandment give I unto you that you love one another, even as I have loved you. For by this shall men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is what John writes when he says, for we know that we have passed from death to life, if we have love for one another. He talks about this love here. The love that gives, the love that is not selfish, that does not seek its own. The love is not puffed up with pride. The love that endures forever. This kind of love is the kind of love that uh, believes all things, endures all things, he hopes all things. This is the kind of love that he's talking about here. And he says, I want you to put in practice this love from the bottom of your heart. And it speaks to you and I. When we are together in the midst of the brethren, we got to walk in agape love. Not only in the midst of the brethren, 
But Jesus says, love your enemies. We got to also oh, put this love in practice when we deal with the people who are not born again. Because when they see this love in us, it gives them that um, attraction. They want to find out what we got. And by finding out, perhaps they will come into the kingdom of God and be saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse um, 24, it says, All people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So here he talks about, um, I think we skipped a verse. We skip verse 23, so we go back to it. I don't want to miss any verse. <laughs> I'm speaking so fast that I, I'm trying to skip a verse. Verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. He tells us here now how we are born again. So, we are born again to the word of God. You see here, we are not born again through the word of God plus good works, plus sacrifices, plus fasting, plus prayer. No. He says it's only by the word of God. And he tells us, what is the word of God? The Bible tells us, this is the word of God. The Bible says, forever it is settled in heaven. The same word of God that uh, Jesus Christ says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. This is the word of God that in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, it tells us that uh, it is like a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. This is the word of God. That uh, it's not far away from us. We don't go looking for the word of God. It is very close to us. We have the word of God in the Bible. We hear the word of God on the radio, television, social media. So we are not going to look for the word of God far away from us. This is why Paul writes. He says the word is near you even in your mouth and in your heart. For with the heart, men believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This is how you got born again. If you will confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is how we get born again. So when you heard the word of God, there is faith that came with the word of God that you heard. And then you give it the corresponding action by believing. And when you believe, you speak with your mouth. You confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you do, you are catapulted from the darkness of this age into the kingdom of light. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so simple that so many people would like to go into the doctrine of syncretism, which means they want to mix it up with something else. They don't believe that this is so simple because they want to think, they want to do something, they want to add something to it. The reason why so many people in the church are not born again because they want to add something to that which God has made simple. All you gotta do is by faith you receive. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, we are now in verse twenty. For, for all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that you, that was preached to you. Everything passes away. 
except the word of God. Regardless of how wealthy you are, regardless of uh, the, uh, the, the, the money you got, everything will pass away. Someday, this world will be dissolved with a feather to hit. It will go away. But the word of God will not. So, man in all their glory, in all their titles, in all their achievements, in all their wealth, he says, he's just like a flower. You turn around, he's alive. Then you turn around again, he's gone. So, what is he telling you here? Do not set your heart on the things that are temporary. But set your heart, your mind, your eyes upon heaven where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, Paul described this even much better. He says, knowing that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and in godliness? Friends, everything will pass away. If you're listening to me today, do not set your mind on the things of this earth. Do not go into the pursuit of things that will pass away, things that will perish. But rather, make a way for your eternal inheritance. Look forward to it. Do not be distracted by the possessions of this earth. This is why Jesus Christ said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing will be added unto you. I've come to the end of today's program. If you are listening to my voice, wherever you are right now, if you are not born again, or perhaps you wandered away from the truth, from Christ, from that fellowship with God. Now is another opportunity for you to come into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? It means that uh, you turn away from your self-righteousness and you depend on Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You ask him to come into your life. You believe that God raised him from the dead and you begin a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. Jesus talking to Nicodemus says, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I tell you that a man must, must be born again. And then he tells us how. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there is no way around it. Don't tell me that uh, you will have access to God without Jesus. The Bible tells us that he that denies the Son also denies the Father. You cannot come to God except through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Do not procrastinate any longer. Tomorrow is not guaranteed unto you. Just today, about 155,000 people died in the world. Some of them were procrastinating. Now it's too late for them. The day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't say, let me go and uh, I, I get myself together and then I will come get born again. No, you could not in your own personal effort. Otherwise, Jesus Christ would not have come. But come as you are. When Jesus catches his own fish, he cleans them. He loves you so much that he's not going to keep you the same way that you came to him. Today is the day for you to make that decision. Nobody's going to make it for you. Your friends, relatives, family members. No, you are the one because God created you and I as free mortal agents. We have the right to make choice. This is one of the biggest choices you can, you can make in your own life. The choice of eternal life. Because when we are gone from here, there is another life that is eternal. And this eternal life has two locations only. Heaven or hell. If you want to spend your eternity with God, now is the time to act upon what you've heard now and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you reject him, there is a place called hell, a place of torture and torment. People go there and they're born forever with fire and brimstone. 
those who rejected Jesus Christ as the Lord and their Savior. Friends, that's why I'm preaching to you today. I love you so much, I don't want you to go to, uh, in that direction. I'm going to lead you now in this very simple prayer. Pray this prayer with me. And today you will be born again and your spirit will be recreated. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I'm now born again, that my sins are washed away. I am now a child of God. Father, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Congratulations. Welcome into the kingdom of God. Find a good church where they teach the word of God and be a member of this church so that you can grow in your faith. I want to thank, use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those helping us to advance the kingdom of God, to take the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to people who've never heard of Jesus before. If you want to be a partaker, please go to our website, kuim.org. And there is a way there you, how you can participate. It is only those who hear the word of God and they put them in practice. They are the ones who will reap the benefits of the word of God. Therefore, be a doer of the word of God. Friends, I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you strength, give you ability, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, provide for you. Oh, give you divine health. Bless the rest of your week. In the name of Jesus. Everybody say, Amen. No matter what you are going through, my friends, trials or tribulations, always remember, surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Una scandala kushko buske. Arabalian gosko badle kerdeske ingal askala pato. Mele vari muskum batibus kumbalite. Kala askala bote. Ene krungen deshe kumbalete. Ina akla fladoste. Quaribus.